One of the things that I want to do to kind of pick up on this is that we're going to uh, see if I get this working. It never works until you start. It does. It works until I get ready to go with it. We just finished with Constantine, his winning his side of the battle. Uh, he's he's now emperor. He has realized by now that the reason that he won was because he fought under the sign of the Christian community. And so once all the dust settles from that and he gets his empire unified, he creates a document called the Edict of Milan and sent this out over the entire Roman Empire, which is kind of the, the eastern side of things. Uh, and he said, when I, Constantine Augustus, I guess he has now really considered himself emperor. Uh, they met and he said, we thought among other things, there's things that we need to do, especially in regard to divinity, so that we might grant that Christians and others full authority to observe that right of religion to which each is preserved and preferred. A lot of times we like to think that Constantine just threw Christianity right up at the top and said, hey, here we are. But what this, this edict did was allow anybody to worship in however they are. It's true freedom of religion is what he projected out. Although he did give preferential treatment to the Christians, he said, therefore, your worship, the bishop of the Christian church, should know that it has pleased us to remove all conditions whatsoever which were in any prescripts formerly given to you officially concerning the Christians. And now may all these be able to observe the Christian religion freely and openly without molestation. Uh, he actually gave them the right to have freedom. Another thing that he did as a part of this, just a little after all this was put forward, forward, he decided that the there needs to be a national holiday every week, a day to rest. And so he establishes Sunday to be a legal holiday, which just conveniently worked with the Christian side of their understanding of how their week begins. And uh, he he termed it that way because he, as we talked earlier, uh, had prayed to the, the sun god. And so that's where Sunday comes from. But it, it went right into the uh, first day of the week for the Christian community. And so what happens now is all these churches that were, in essence, underground and disjointed from each other suddenly find the ability to come up and worship openly and begin to talk with one another. And they find out that there is such an overwhelming difference in what they now believe. And all of this is being developed over a period of about 250 years. After Paul, after all that, you've got all this time of these people trying to figure it out and, and put things together. And they talked about uh, how do we, as people who call ourselves Christian, uh, decide which books that we have are authorized type books that we can teach and preach from, and which ones do we not need to know from? Who has the right to interpret Scripture? Uh, who, what person can do that? Uh, how do we do things in the church like baptism? Do we dunk them underwater? Do we splash them like you know, river and a little devil? Do you? Do we? Do we just kind of touch you a little bit? Uh, who is eligible to come to the table and receive the elements of communion? And and even under the the umbrella of all of this, you have theological differences especially in regards to Jesus and who Jesus is. And so the church gets in a fight with each other and they are squabbling with each other so much. Constantine himself 
wrote a letter to all the bishops. And now a bishop would be someone who would be like an, a, the bishop of Rome in some of these cities, where a bishop would be some leader over a, a, a set of churches somewhere. And so he called, I think there were 313 or so bishops. He wrote and said, you show up at Nicaea and we're going to straighten this thing out. So it was really a pagan who told the church, you better get it together. And so they all gather together and suddenly find out that things are all out of whack. Uh, the main force of it all was to fight against a term called um, Arianism. And these are the, uh, these people are ones who said they weren't really sure that Jesus was the, quote, son of God that Jesus was a product of God. And there were several groups that, that stretched that. Uh, they said that he was just a good guy that God picked out to be the one to do the leadership. Uh, there was another group who were almost mystics who said that, yes, Jesus was the son of God, but he really didn't have a, a physical body form. That it was a... a almost like a hologram that you would see. And of course, they went so far as to say that he didn't really die on the cross because he really wasn't on the cross. And you had all these heresy type things going underneath about how you define uh, what we believe. And so under this came all of these. Uh, a guy by the name of Eubius uh, was one who said that you had to define Jesus the way the Bible is says, and that is that he is fully human, yet he's fully divine at the same time. And he comes up with this really nice word, homoousius, which means of the same substance. Even though he was human, he had the essence of God in him. And so that was trying to take care of that and, and put it over to the side. And so they began to work at the Council of Nicaea to say, where are the boundaries that we as a Christian community set to say, these are the things you have to believe to be Christian. And then there's peripheral things on the outside that you can kind of work through. And so in order to do that, they came up with a creed. Uh, one way you protect yourself is to build a fence around yourself. And the whole purpose of the creed is to build a fence around the body of faith that says, this is what makes us who we are. And so the Nicene Creed uh, comes out, and this is around 325 when they finally get this. They go back around 381 and they tweak it a little bit. But it tells you the process, and it's very similar. Our, our Apostles' Creed is, is a part of all of this process. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. Okay, so you define who God is, the maker and creator of everything. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all the worlds, light of light, very God of God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father by whom things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin and the Virgin Mary and was made man. He was crucified us under Pontius Pilate and suffered and was buried. And on the third day, he rose again, according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven, and stood at the right hand of the Father. From thence he shall come again with glory to judge the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. So that's the whole broad concept of who Jesus is. Uh, we say some things like that. Our, the Apostles' Creed is kind of a condensed version of some of this. Uh, one of the things that, that struggled and mysteriously disappeared from the Apostles' Creed when the church came over on this side of the pond, was that statement, and he descended to the dead. 
we still have that in some like our baptismal rituals and some of those you still have that that were in there because people thought protestants thought that the concept of that was buying in uh to purgatory jesus went down to hell into purgatory and preached and got them all out well that's not the true meaning of that statement it was a, a stance against all those people who said Jesus didn't really die on the cross. He was crucified, he died, he was buried, and he descended into the dead, which is another way of saying he was really, really dead. And then he rose. So it was trying to convince people that this, this line of crucified, died, and, and, and risen could all be affirmed. So you define that, and then you move to the next section. And in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, and who spoke to the prophets in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. There are no denominations at this point. There is just Christianity. You don't have Baptist, Methodist, or Presbyterians. There is one singular church for Christians. And, and that Holy Catholic Church is not a title, it's an encompassing body. All of us together form that church. Uh, we acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. We look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. And so now they have a, a, a boundary line. If you believe in these things, if you affirm these things, then you can consider yourself a Christian. Then you can work on other things like what kind of juice do you use? What kind of wine do you use at, at the, the Eucharistic meal? What kind of bread? What do you do in baptism? What do you say in baptism? Those types of things get worked out later on. So now they've got the church together and they decide now and ask permission, can we now begin to build churches so our people can gather in mass instead of in little houses? And they said, yes, you can. And the, the church, uh, interesting enough, uh, they connect to a group of architects that's called the Byzantine Architecture. And it's interesting because at the same time, the Jewish communities around there uh, accepted a Greco-Roman style. Theirs have the columns and the things and almost looks like the little um, memorials that were built to the gods, Roman gods and things. That's what the Jewish church began to, to establish, the Jewish synagogues. Here you have the Byzantine architecture, which at this time is, I guess we would consider it clunky. Thick walls, small windows, uh, not a tall structure at all. Uh, and one of the classes I took at Oxford was from uh, Robin Gibson Gibbons, who is an expert in church architecture. So I just thought I'd just show you. Uh, this is Robert, Robin, and I in Oxford outside a famous telephone booth. He was one of the ones who sat on my defense committee. Uh, when I defended my PhD. The other guy over there, the one on the far side looks tough, but now you have to understand it was a rainy day in Oxford. Uh, this, this is Rabbi Norman Solomon that I speak of every so often. Uh, here. But he talks about the architecture and the structure of the church itself. And so the first church is lined out very similar to this. You have an entrance and an atrium. This is where the people began to gather. Uh, you may even have a font of water right here. You have a narthex, which is kind of the pre-entrance. And then you have the nave. All of this is open. And then up here, you have the altar in the, in a little crook and a chair for the bishop or the, the pastor of that church. Uh, and it works there. There are no pews or chairs. When people went to church, 
you stood up the whole time. And the only one who sat down was the bishop, the one over the church. And everything the bishop did was from the chair. He read the scripture from the chair. He did uh, the uh, his preaching from the chair. The only time he would really get up is when they would get ready to do the Eucharist. And that was done with the altar basically against the wall. And he would have his back uh, to the congregation. And so they would sit around and, and take that. Uh, structures popped up all around. And most of them were uh, almost like these things we talked about early on uh, with these rock piles and Ebenezer's. If someone famous or notable in the community who had done wonderful things for the church, they would build a church over their grave and kind of enshrine it. If you've ever been to Europe and walked around the cathedrals and the churches in Europe, you walk over dead people everywhere. The whole floor is nothing but a constant tombstone of one thing or the other. That was the part of the, uh, the their way of affirming the church. So they, they were built. They then started putting cemeteries next to the church to help them. They had thick walls. They had very small windows. And uh, they needed to brighten things up. So this is where they began to use tapestries and paintings in the church to try to give these dull walls a little bit of color. And uh, they would also use begin to use uh, candles. When when our service begins, the first thing we do is we bring in the light. And we light it. And especially in smaller churches, you go up to the communion table and you have two candles on the altar table, one on each side. We have six. But uh, people would always like to say, now this is just something that we really brought. It came from the earliest of the church where they bring the light of Christ in and they light the candle. And then at the end of the service, they put it out and they carry the light of Christ out. That's a wonderful thought. I mean, it really is. But the deal was, the reason the candles are on the table like that is because it's so dark in that building that the leader cannot read the scripture or the text that they need to, to read. And they have to have lights there. And so the candles were there simply as a utility to have the light there. They needed to be able to read. And this is the first time that what was called the sacred meal, that is, the, that communion event, was not done in a local home. Now, everybody gathers at a church and you have the Eucharist together. What had once been a full meal now becomes a, a Eucharistic or Holy Communion. Uh, and then you have to begin to define what happens there. Um, there's three definitions of what happens with uh, the elements. And, and they begin to process according to time. The early church felt like that when you did that uh, Eucharistic or communion liturgy, remember the ones that we talked about, Apollos and the Didoche that defined all of that for us. When they started that, when they picked up the bread and said, this is the body of Christ, it literally turns into the body of Christ. And when they pick up the cup of wine, the wine literally become the, the blood of Christ. If you go to a Catholic church, and probably uh, like a Greek Orthodox church, when those words are said in the Eucharist, many times he will say the body of Christ broken for you, and you'll hear a little bell. And that little bell is a signal that something magical has suddenly happened to this, this element. The same thing with the cup. Later on, when Luther, Martin Luther, brings it into Protestantism, uh, well, and that is called consubstanti uh, trans transubstantiation. The elements completely transform into the body and blood of Christ. Luther said, no, that's not what happens. Uh, the, when you have communion, you have consubstantiation. That is, 
The bread is bread, the wine is wine, but the spirit of Christ enters into those elements. So you're still taking the body and blood of Christ. Uh, there was a guy by the name of Aldrich Zwingli, who uh, was around the same time as Luther and was one that John Wesley picked up his cue from. And he said, the bread remains bread. The wine remains wine, but the spirit of Christ surrounds us because it is indeed a memorial meal. And so they began to take that and, and how that began to worship together. Uh, they began to have a standardized liturgy, how we do these things every week. The early church accepted Latin as the language of worship. And that's fine right there in Rome and other places. But when you get beyond that, it's not so fine because people don't understand Latin. Uh, in fact, uh, there came a time when the capital of the Roman Empire shifted from Rome down to Constantinople, where they spoke Greek. And all the churches down there worshipped in Greek. And that later on, we'll talk about how that split makes a, a grand difference. Uh, they also decided that it was time to, to create some type of a pattern. And so they decided to carve the, the year up into sections and feast. You have a Christmas time. Uh, you have an Easter time. You have an ordinary time. And so by the, by the time you get to the fourth century, the church now is full of images of Christ. Around this time is the first time Christ, the image of Christ on the cross really becomes popular. Prior to that, you will see Christ standing in front of an empty tomb. Uh, you'll see Christ on the seashore or being baptized. You may see the symbol of the fish, but you never really saw Christ on the cross. And it was about the fourth century that that became popular. Uh, and also at that same time came the uh, the congregational response to all of this, and that is the giving of the sign of the cross. That is one of the earliest Christian traditions that we have. And in fact, when John Wesley wrote his uh, memo to the Church of America when we were founding, he encouraged the members of the Church of America to continue doing that. Wesley never stopped it. He was a good Anglican. Uh, the problem was that when we came to this side of the ocean, we started comparing ourselves to the Catholics and the Anglicans, and we didn't want to do that because it looked too Catholic. And so we just quit doing it. And... Uh, and it seems odd sometimes that we have someone in our worship service and something goes on and we'll see them stop into that pew and, and bow toward that altar or our prayers being said and we see the sound. We feel kind of odd about it. Really, we ought to embrace it and say, that's, that's the way they've done it for 2,000 years. The, now, by this time, you also have special clergy, people designated to do nothing in their occupation but to take care of the church and take care of the flock. And part of that goes with the priestly guard. Uh, it started out as just an awl, a white uh, outer robe. That's what they wore to preach in. And finally, by the time of the fifth century, the bishops began to wear uh, purple rather than white. And so you had the, the churches beginning to really look like churches with cemeteries, uh, and now you have a full-blown place to worship. Um, the space is open except for the bishop's chair and the altar. There is a baptismal font where you, uh, the people would would uh, cleanse themselves. This goes back all the way to, you remember when we talked about the, the, the foundation of the, uh, the tabernacle and the laver, the big bowl of water where they would wash themselves and clean themselves. And then in the temple, you had that, but then you later, in Jesus' time, you had the baptismal uh, baths where you would wash yourself and cleanse yourself before you go into the, the temple. The same type of thing. By the Middle Ages, you had gotten to where the baptismal font held cold water, and baptism was done by sprinkling. 
and then moved on. One of the most humorous things I, I when I teach uh, world religion at, at Sneed, and I would get into Christianity and talk about things. I had this one little clip that I would show of a Greek Orthodox baptism of a baby, which uh, we would all laugh at, even though it was a serious situation. But the baby was given to the priest buck naked. And the font is about this big around. And when he finally said, I baptize you in the name of the Father, he takes that naked baby and just all the way under the water. And then in the sun, and in the Holy Spirit, which you know is going to be an exciting event after the third swish in cold water. Uh, but that's the way they, they kind of moved it uh, the, and, and got down to it. Uh, did, it, did the baptism start out that way in the fourth, fifth century, or did it kind of evolve? It's, it's evolved. We, I, I've gotten in good, some good conversations. Uh, I was playing golf with my brother-in-law, and he invited two guys from a nearby church to play. And this one guy taught Sunday school. And I don't know, maybe that was the Sunday school lesson of the day or something. Because suddenly he got on this thing about baptism. And he said, in the New Testament, you have baptismo, which means to, to go underwater. So that's the only way you can be baptized. And I kind of mumbled under my breath, no, it's not. And, and that's as far as I went. Ken was surprised at my uh, stalwartness. <laughs> but the Jewish people didn't baptize like we like we think. Uh, the, the baptism that John would have, and probably the baptism that Jesus had, was basically a, a self-baptism, very similar to the pool. You would have walked into the water, and then you would have dipped yourself under to try to come up clean for the presence of God. But as you exited the water, there was people like John the Baptist and, and uh, priest and others who would on the side of the, of the water would offer you another splash of water on top of your head as a prayer of blessing in God's uh, presence. The earliest pictures of baptism that we have have Jesus standing right next to the bank and John the Baptist with a shell pouring water over Jesus' head. This becomes a major contention when we get to this next session about uh, how we begin to pick and choose. But uh, a lot of it was out of necessity. These places were cold and damp. You didn't want to put somebody completely underwater uh, and catch pneumonia or something. And so sprinkling uh, the touch of uh, water was the preferred way because there's nothing in the Bible that says you have to have so much water to make it right. So that's that's the gist of, of how that it evolves later on. Um, the uh, the Catholic Church continues to do that. They don't immerse people, as far as I know, unless there's a special occasion. Uh, so you had by the time you finished that part of it, then the service itself started becoming a little more pomp and circumstance. Uh, uh, four or five hundred, you have processionals coming into the church. You have choirs beginning to be developed. So you'll have the bishop and some a small group of singers come in to, to sit in. The vessels that were at one time small and very simple became large and ornate. The, the, the uh, chalice for the, the wine, the larger platen for the bread, because you had to do more people. It had to be able to hold more. Uh, there is, and, and it's still our, our practice today is when you go in and you see communion, you see all these white cloths laying on top of the elements, these linen cloths that we have somewhere that that's connected to something very holy and sacred. The reason we do that in its origin is that you wanted to keep flies and bugs off the elements. Uh, you didn't want a, a bug in your wine. And so they would cover it with white linen to keep it clean until you started to serve the Eucharistic elements and, and move on down from there. Uh, later they moved to a Roman 
Romanesque architecture where the building was taller, the windows were larger, uh, you could get more people in there. Uh, stained glass became popular in this church. Not, not pictures on the wall, it was pieces of colored glass. You know, the reds and the blues and the yellows and the greens and those would filter in, and many times, if they were put in the right place, they would give almost a purple-type hue. Um, I passed the church in North Birmingham one time that had multicolored windows. And when I preached on Sunday morning, there was one spot that the sun would hit just right. And when I would start preaching, there was a purple spot right inside on the left side of the aisle. You know, they went across between the pews. And I could almost time it by watching that purple spot go across the floor. If it got to this time, it was time to shut up and get off. <laughs> but but the colored glass, they gave a different hue because now you really could see what was going on. And the floor plan is much more open and it becomes acrostic. That is, the church itself is shaped like a cross. That's like our sanctuary with the naves on each side. Uh, you have the narthex, narthex and the nave. You have a spot here for the people to stand. You have the chancel. By this time, the pulpit has been introduced and has become a central place of worship. And then the altar is behind that. Uh, it's on the eastern wall as you move. Uh, toward it. The churches were always built in a uh, east-west orientation and that was because the altar was against the eastern wall and when the priest would uh, do communion, the Eucharistic, he would be, he would have the congregation behind him and he would be facing that back wall and he would do that facing east, facing Jerusalem. Uh, there was a, a term for that, and it's ad orientum, which meant facing east. And it stayed that way in the Catholic Church until about 1964 or so, when you had the Vatican II. And in Vatican II, uh, the Catholic Church pulls the, the, the altar away from that back wall so that the priest can come around and face the congregation like we do and give communion, which is versus populum, which means facing the people. But one of the things about uh, the uh, doing that, by this time, the clerical garb has embraced a larger element. You have a robe and you have a chasm, uh, a big sheet looking thing, uh, that he wears over his robe, and it has become ornate. Uh, it has tapestry-type things on the front. One of the fa favorite symbols of the church was a peacock, because a peacock would, would come in all of its beauty, then it would lose all of its feathers, then suddenly all the feathers would come back, so supposedly more beautiful than before. And it was a sign of death and resurrection of Christ. So they would put peacocks on the back of these chasubles. And so when the priest would do the Eucharist, he would have his back to the congregation. And when he would take the cup and the bread and offer them up, he would spread that cape. And that whole peacock would just you know, open up for the congregation to remind them of the death and resurrection of Christ. Now there's a unique element of that. And as I said, everything everywhere at this time is done in Latin. And many, many of the commoners did not know Latin, but they understood what was going on. And when the priest came up to the elements, and we began to say those words of, of blessing over the Eucharist, talk gets corpus unum, this is my body. Something magical happened 
to take that bread and turn it into the body of Christ. And they felt like that there's something about that that we need to know, that we need to have that gives us some type of power. It is from that statement we have one of our greatest magical words, hocus pocus, because they didn't understand what's going on. And of course, the other side of that uh, is what happens when children don't understand things. When children don't understand things, they make fun of things. And so they would start making fun of the priest and how the priest did the Eucharist. And so they would sing about it. You put your right hand in, you take your right hand out, you take your right hand in, and you shake it all about. You do the hokey pokey, and you turn yourself around. That's what it's all about. It was a mockery of the way the priest was raising the bread, raising the wine, saying all these magic words and then turning around and say, here you go. And so they, they would mock the, uh, the priest doing that. Uh, also that was thrown in because of that was the institution of what we would call morality plays. Um, people wouldn't understand what was going on in church. They, they would probably understand the little homily that the priest would say, but nothing else. And so they would have small troops create a little play or drama to try to make a point of what the lesson was about that day and, and move on from there. And suddenly that began to grow into an art of the, where this is where we get our Christmas pageant from. When we bring in the animals and the angels and all of those. Uh, the Easter pageants became very popular about that. Uh, many churches had written liturgies, uh, book of hours to celebrate things. Uh, it's during this time also that uh, the veneration of Mary becomes very popular. Uh, they, they had this theology that said that Mary was the link between broken humanity and perfect divinity and so she is the queen of the apostles and so she holds a special place uh, if you've ever gone into a greek orthodox church when you go to a greek orthodox church and you walk in right over the door before you enter that sanctuary will be the words theotokos which means god bearer or mother of God, and they re highly revered Mary as a part of the divine there. Uh, that showed up in a, what was called the Book of Hours, where they would follow around. And so by this time, you suddenly have a, a, a structure. You have an opening introit that's either spoken or sung. You have a prayer, that Kiri Laison prayer, a greeting, a collect, which is a short prayer, the epistle reading, a reading from a psalm, or a psalm that is sung, the gospel, presentation of gifts, chanting over the gifts, a prayer over the gifts, the Eucharistic prayer, the Lord's prayer, the peace, communion, and dismissal. What you don't see in there is that big, big slot in the middle that says sermon. Uh, later on, you had this it's, it's still termed a homily, which means short speech, which is short because it simply is supposed to address the gospel of the day. And then as we have gone on, we've gone from short homily to full evangelistic sermons that sometimes can go on forever. Um, that, that all held true, and things were... Okay, even though even from the earlier days there was a tension in the church because of the language to use. And finally, in 1054, we have what is noted as the Great Schism. And this is the break between the Eastern and Western Church. And it was done because of some very fundamental differences uh, one was, do you have to be, try to worship in Latin? 
And, and the Eastern Church says, no, you're supposed to do it in Greek. So language of worship was part of it. Uh, there is a thing about the Petrine doctrine. That is, Rome has to be the center because Peter founded the church, and that's where it all starts. And the Western Church said, I mean, the Eastern Church says, no, that's not true. And then this is where you come up with the concept of celibacy. Suddenly, at this time, the Western Church decides that their clergy is going to have to be celibate. And the Orthodox Church uh, says, no, that's not right. In fact, I, I was in a, a, a session over in Oxford with a, a, a Roman Orthodox. And it is a requirement that their clergy be married before they can pass to a church. And so that was part of it. And then of all things, they got into a fight about what type of bread and what type of wine do you use when you serve communion? Do you use red? Do you use white? Do you use whole wheat bread? Do you use unleavened? They got into a fight over that. So the church split. Now, it's leadership split, but there has always been universal cooperation. Uh, the, the Eastern Church still works cooperatively with the Western Church, but when they talk about the Pope, to them, he is not the Pope of the whole church. He is simply the Bishop of Rome. Uh, and, and so that's how you work. When, when a when a pope dies, you'll see all these representatives from the Eastern Church come in and pay homage to the to the uh, uh, bishop of, of Rome. And so by that time, you move into a Gothic art architecture, which is kind of where we see now in, in all over Europe with the big spires and the huge windows. Uh, you've got these what they call flying buttresses now, which means you can have large open spaces and and uh, the extreme heights, the whole concept of these spires is to reach up toward heaven, which is the difference between Eastern and Western church. If you go to a, a an Eastern Orthodox church, you won't see a spire on the church. What you see is a dome in the middle. And they said, you can't point to God because God is everywhere. And so in the center of their worship space, will be this great big dome and usually the images of the apostles and Jesus will be in the middle and other maybe saints around that so that you look up and God is everywhere. In the uh, Western church, they've got all these things pointing straight up to God uh, in these spires. Uh, Was there any significance to the Moving from one architecture to another, Byzantine to just the just, the, the just the style and, and, and what, what it does for the church. This means now you can have an even larger place for people to gather than what you did before. Uh, each, each step uh, grew with the architecture of the day that in large spaces, larger and larger and larger. So you could have more people come in. And that's what the, the style here brings up and and it creates space for other things by the time you move to this architecture churches begin having organs inside of them uh, musical instruments like that which take up a lot of space uh, you will probably by this time have a choir loft or a place for the choir itself uh, you have uh, a pulpit and a lectern now and many of them where you just kind of separate the church the, the laity who may read and the clergy who are the official church people. Uh, one thing that did happen around this time uh, was that people became very suspicious of the communion service, especially with it being in a different language. And they found out what the words really mean. And they were afraid that they were participating in cannibalism. If this bread really does turn into the human Christ, if this blood becomes the blood of Christ, are we not becoming cannibals? And the priest couldn't explain it well enough. And there came a period of time where the only people who took the elements were the priests. 
And then eventually, at one point in time, they convince the people to at least take the bread. And then from there, it became uh, accepted by the laity. Uh, now, this move to Gothic architecture really only applies to the Western Church, right? The Eastern Church. It has it, yeah. The Orthodox move went in their own direction. They did. And, and it's more that Roman, I mean, uh, Russian sort of style that we see. A lot of domes yeah. and spires, but uh, it, has, it has its own separate architecture. Uh, One of the things that we also know at this time is that there is no such thing as a Bible for the laity. Uh, the, the church thought that the Bible was too dangerous an instrument to put into the hands of the laity. And so the, it was forbidden for lay people to read the Bible. The clergy were supposed to interpret it and tell you what was in there. And I know that kind of sounds harsh, but in some sense, it made being a Christian easier because you didn't have all these rules and regulations that you could squeeze out of all these Pauline writings. You just went to church and lived to be the best person you could be. That's what a Christian was all about. And so really it gave them a, a concept of what was going on. Things took a big shift in the 14th century uh, by this con uh, terrible thing he called the Black Plague that swept across Europe. And it scared the people so much that they were afraid that if they died without taking communion on a regular basis, they would not go to heaven. And so people started bringing uh, benches and chairs and even tables to church for the sick people to sit on and to lay on so that they could be in church and take that and not lose that edge of, of fulfilling what was required. And this is where suddenly other people saw that and said, well, if they can sit down and enjoy it, why can't I bring my chair and sit down and enjoy it? And so from there, you begin to have these outer naves with chairs and, and uh, areas where people could sit. Many times families would pay for them themselves. Sometimes they would have locked gates on them. You know, we've heard that say, oh, no, don't sit there. That's this so-and-so's pew. Well, this was literally so. Uh, they would lock them. And they, this is where we sit. Don't mess with them. But that was a transition from a church that was standing to a church that is sitting. And, and claiming their space. When when I was in Oxford one time, one evening they were going to do a presentation of uh, Fares Requiem at the uh, Christ Church Cathedral. And I decided, well, I would do that. And so when I went to buy tickets, they gave tickets uh, in in three sections. You were... You could buy a high price ticket in the nave. That's the center part of the church where you could see the musicians and the singers. You could buy a second tier, which was just on the outside of the nave, where you could see some of the choir and hear the music. And then you had the third tier where you just heard the music. That's where I said. <laughs> but that's, that's the way it was kind of divvied out of, of all the pomp and circumstances. Uh, the liturgical colors started to come in that defined for us the, uh, the church year. And that's part of this is to tell the, the, the unknown laity what's going on. Stained glass windows in the church were, have come at this time. Now they're putting pictures in stained glass windows and they would depict scenes from the life of Christ. So people would remember the stories of Jesus. You would know what you, uh, season of the church year you were in. Because when I walk into church, I see a certain color on the pyramids of the pulpit or on the priest. And I would know what the year is. Uh, it always starts off on no in the 1st of November with All Saints Day. 
where you revere all of those who have gone before. Then you have a little gap, maybe one or two Sundays, between that when you start into Advent, which is purple, unless you're contemporary, and it's blue, and we're in blue. Uh, somebody asked a, a friend of mine who was a pastor about why they used blue in the church, and he said it's because it's a boy. But, uh, so you have that purple or blue during Advent, and then you have white for Christmas Eve and all the way through the Epiphany and the Baptism. Then you have a short green time, which is called ordinary time, just the teaching. And then you begin to move into Lent and Easter and all of that act, Sundays after Easter, move up to Pentecost, which is red. Uh, and then you move into this large uh, green area. If you can, this is a, a more traditional style over here. And you see there's only one slip of red all year. Uh, and that's Pentecost Sunday. Uh, in the wisdom of the United Methodist Church a number of years ago, uh, they decided that they were going to split. This is 26 weeks long, this ordinary time. That's half a year. And they decided to create what they called Kingdom Tide. And so they were going to take the first half of that and wear red, and the second half of it would be green. In one of the churches where I was a pastor, uh, in summer, I convinced the people to celebrate some saint or something once a month so we could wear red once a month uh, throughout that. Uh, Trinity recognizes kingdom time. After Easter and after Pentecost, when we turn red in Pentecost, you'll see our ministers wear red for quite a while. And then toward the end of the summer, you'll see them shift into what we're now wearing is green. And so all of this is created to help teach people a cycle. And of course, with this comes the, the lectionary cycle, which says we're going to read a gospel every three years. Year A is uh, Matthew, year B is Mark, year C is Luke, and the gospel of John is spread out over those three. And so you have a cycle so that every three years you go through the entire life of Christ uh, through all the Gospels. And every year you go through the life of Christ through at least one as a primary. Moving it through there. Uh, dress for clergy now goes uh, to more of a stole and robe type thing. Uh, Methodist traditionally uh, wore a, an academic robe rather than a clerical robe. You still see Methodist ministers wear clerical collars from time to time. When I was doing my seminary work, Bishop Cannon encouraged us to wear that. He said, you're somebody different. You're somebody special. And you have, you've been called to do something. So he said, acknowledge that. I used to keep a clerical collar shirt in my closet. And if someone went to the hospital at night, I would always put that shirt on so I could go with that shirt on, I could go anywhere in the hospital I wanted to. Uh, but then every now and then I'd hop on an elevator and someone would kind of nod their head, good evening, Father. <laughs> okay, I asked for it. Uh, so you, you move through this whole Christian year, getting through, and you have gotten now a complete worship process although it is in Latin. And then comes something that changes the world. 1454, Mr. Gutenberg creates the movable printing press. And one of the first things he prints is a Bible. Now, it's not in English. The version of the Bible that he printed was the Vulgate, which was the Latin version of the Bible, which the priest used. But as this began to change, uh, it made a major, major impact on the church itself. The uh, 
a lay person could get their hands on a Bible and start reading it for themselves. And when this happens, we as a Christian community make a tremendous shift back to Pharisaism because now we can read the Bible and see where it says do not and we can go to our neighbor and point our finger at them and says, the Bible says you can't do that. And so it really created quite a, and they were right, it created a dangerous instrument for just the lay people itself. Uh, by this time, also, you had the church with all these churches out there and many of them now needing to be repaired. They had to have more money and they shipped into this concept called indulgences. Oh, you want to get out of purgatory quicker? You want to go to heaven faster? Uh, you want to get forgiven for your sins? We'll pay the church a little money and we'll take care of that. And so that begins to create an entire concept and rub within the church that we'll start on uh, next week. And so that's the, the history of it all this week. We do have the questions that we kind of get into. Uh, we talked about the Nicene Creed. Uh, we say, you know, are you aware of that the Nicene, that the Apostles' Creed that we use, it's not just a casual statement, but it's actually a list of what we are expected to do as Christians. Uh, every now and then we need to stop and really think about the words. And <laughs> the credo, the word credo, means this I believe. And when you say the Apostles' Creed, the statements that you are saying, you are affirming, this is what I believe. And so how do we feel with all of that? Um, talk about the religious leaders wearing special vestments and clothing. Our clergy does. Uh, now they don't in the new room. And that's a, a style that we'll talk about later. But in we, we like to call it traditional worship. Uh, I'd rather call it classical worship. Uh, and contemporary is not contemporary. Contemporary is anything that's happening right now. At one time, Handel's Messiah was a contemporary piece of music. Uh, so contemporary means it, this is what's happening right now. And traditional uh, has a way of kind of feeling, oh, I, I don't want to call it classical because it, it, it is from that pattern that we gain our worship service from, from an older pattern of worship. Uh, and our clergy wear vestments with, with the... Uh, the colors that remind us of who we are, uh, we still go through that process. It asks about what symbolism is found in your worship space. What, when you step into the sanctuary, what's the first thing that you're really drawn to? Just the altar yeah. in, in general, you, know, you can see the cross. And yeah, that whole end mm -hmm. with the little organ and how it right. surrounds everything. Very much like that nave niche mm -hmm. in the early church. Yeah. And the architecture, at least to me, does make you want to look up. Right. Right. Yeah. That raising space. Mm -hmm. um, and we we use a lot of symbolism in our worship that sometimes we don't really pay attention to uh, in, in Advent and uh, in, uh, Lent we have these uh, banners and things on the sides of the chancel itself of course we change our pyramids on a regular base uh, there are times like World Communion Sunday when you'll come in and there's not just a, a cup and a piece of bread there may be breads from all over the world there there's and, and I think it's a neat thing when you walk in uh, one Sunday, and there's this extra banner up front acknowledging the baptism of a baby. And the neat thing about it is that baby's name is on that banner. I just always thought that was special. But you, you walk in the worship service and say, oh, we got something special going on. They like the candle. Mm -hmm. that right. Baptism. Tradition has it they're supposed to light that candle every year on the day they were baptized. I'm not really sure if anybody has ever done that. <laughs> but yeah. that's what you're supposed to do. Ask my wife. That's it. Um, for kids. 
we kept them in the freezer for years. And I, I guess we gave them to our girls when they got married. Passed them on. And of course, the big thing uh, when we talk about the, the colors and the process of worship. Worship isn't worship unless you connect with God. And so somewhere in that space and time, there needs to be something that connects you personally to a sense of the divine. And I think I've said it before here. Sometimes it may be a prelude uh, or an offertory or an anthem. Or, or maybe sometimes uh, the pastor starts hitting something that just kind of gets so close to home with you, you feel like God's talking to you. Somewhere down in there, uh, if we don't feel we have made a connection with God's presence, it kind of makes us wonder why we're here. So that's our task. That's, that's what worship is all about, making that, that connection. Mitchell Williams told me one time that he's had the experience where after a service, he would have somebody come up to him, <clears throat> excuse me, and, and just say, oh, your service just meant so much to me. It just really, your, your sermon, it really spoke to me today. And he said, well, what was it that I said? And, and they would say something and you think that wasn't in my service. And and he, he said that's a God moment. Yeah. Yeah. I saw him at church one Sunday. We had gone out to eat and they came in later and he came over and spoke. And I said, uh, I, I I had enjoyed the sermon of that day. And he said, Well, what made it so enjoyable? And I said, Well, it's not enjoy the way that makes you happy. I said, I enjoy a sermon when it challenges me to have to stop and think about something. And that's what he did for me that day. He planted a seed that I needed to ponder a little bit. And so I enjoy that that experience. But Mitchell had a, a gift for pulling those little things, things out. Any other comment? Yeah, uh, this, this era, the thing that always... I always think a lot about is, you know, how little, I mean, I don't really know if Jesus said anything about how worship was to be done, you know, right. the structure of the church and what people should wear, you know, he didn't really talk about any of that. Mm -hmm. And so it's interesting to see how, you know, it evolved into this more and more elaborate structure. Right. But, I mean, that was all kind of, people coming up with those things. Well, and of course, and that's one of the things I had mentioned last week. Uh, when Jesus finally went up at the ascension, he told the disciples to go out and be witnesses. He never said go build a church or, or gather more people together. He just said be witnesses and teach the people what you have seen of me. And uh, there have been times when people would start challenging me in my faith and, and I would say, well, I'm a follower of Jesus. Because what they would want to do is they would want to challenge me with all these things they had picked up from Pauline writings and other places. And I said, well, you know, if I if I can follow the things that Jesus told me, everything else will take its place, rightful place. They're not saying that it's not important to read Paul's writings and Paul's instruction, but uh, Paul is not the savior of the world. Let's check out what Jesus said and follow what Jesus did and said, and then I think we'll be all right. And Jesus didn't tell us to wear purple during that. <laughs> no, no, he didn't.